Ceasefires in vain as fighting continues in Sudan. Over 100,000 people have fled the country with even more internally displaced. Diplomatic efforts are being stepped up to bring warring factions to the table, but fears remain the conflict will only spiral further out of control. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's Newsmaker is fighting in Sudan. What many define as a civil war continues in Sudan for more than three weeks, and despite several ceasefires, the war rages on with gunfire and explosions echoing across the capital on Tuesday. Tension had been building for months between the Sudanese armed forces and the paramilitary rapid support forces, which together toppled a civilian government in an October 2021 coup. The friction was brought to a head by an internationally backed plan to launch a new transition government with civilian parties. A final deal was due to be signed in early April, on the fourth anniversary of the popular overthrow of autocrat Omar al-Bashir. Both the army and the RSF were required to cede power under the plan, but it didn't go that way. And since April 15th, fighting has increased across the country. Now, it looks like both sides will come together for talks in Saudi Arabia. The head of the Arab League on Tuesday met with a representative of Sudanese military leader General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan in Cairo, where he warned against external interference. The instability of Sudan, the disintegration of Sudan, is not the disintegration of the region and beyond. And our appeal to the international community to understand that what is happening in Sudan is an internal matter and we are able to contain it, and we do not allow any external interference. I am talking to you now, and there are contacts regarding the completion of this truce. But we want this truce to be with the participation of the political institutions to which we belong, the first of which is the Arab League, and also the African Union. But that it takes place with their approval and in all these details, and we do not accept anything imposed on us by whichever direction. Well, in the weeks since fighting started, over 500 people have died and nearly 5,000 have been injured. Medical institutions across Sudan are facing a shortage of oxygen. Most public hospitals in Khartoum have suspended operations, and most are short on fuel. The UN says half a million people have been displaced by the fighting, with 100,000 fleeing to other countries, warning that this could become a regional catastrophe. Of course, these movements are complicated by a whole series of factors of instability and lack of security along transit routes, uh, the lack of fuel and transport services for people who are desperate to leave Sudan, fleeing to safety, as well as inflation in the marketplace. Now, we're seeing some extremely fast-moving situations along the borders. We're looking very closely at Ethiopia, for example, uh, where the number of people uh, arriving daily is between 900 and 1,000. The needs there are very serious. There's a, a desperate lack of, of wash services, food, shelter, water, uh, medical assistance, and indeed support for onward transportation. Well, joining me now to discuss the situation in Sudan, as well as the potential for negotiations, are from Riyadh, Mohammed al kubaiban He is a retired Royal Saudi Air Force Major General and a Saudi and Gulf Affairs expert. From London, we have Muna Kugali. She's an activist and co-founder of the April Ramadan Sudanese Martyrs Families Organization. And completing our panel from Washington, D.C. is Cameron Hudson. He's a former CIA official and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. Thanks all so much for being with us. I have to mention that we were supposed to be joined as well from a guest from Khartoum, but not surprisingly, uh, connection issues made that uh, impossible. Um, he happened to be a supporter of the former regime of Omar al-Bashir, and interestingly, he told us that most parts of the country are actually stable, including in Khartoum, in spite of everything we may have seen in the media. Muna, let me ask you, is, is there any way uh, that that's actually possible, that the country is relatively stable at this point? No, it's not at all, not stable at all. 
because sometimes they leave one area, they go to the other one, and then they, uh, the others come to the same area again. And then people, we keep receiving videos from relatives or friends from Sudan that are filmed at the same time they are sending it. Uh, it shows lots deal of uh, atrocities or uh, vicious acts by both sides. Okay. And recently they have bombarded uh, safe areas of civilians. You have seen them yourself. So it's in um, um, Salama, uh, Jabaloli a few days ago, and other areas like Hayusif and others. So mm. the, those are civilian uh, people who live in peace, who are uh, have no relation with any one of them. Yet they are bombarded, they are killed, and we've seen women who sell tea, and uh, one of them has her leg in, in the place that she's used uh, to sell her tea and coffee in. And right. other uh, hospitals are full of uh, other um, uh, people. Uh, that's what so, I, I don't want to say unique about this conflict, but so particularly disturbing about it is that it seems most of the civilians don't support at all one side or the other. So, I mean, not only is it not stable, but Cameron, let me ask you, do you have to laugh, actually, when you hear it reported worldwide that these two generals have agreed to ceasefires somehow, when you know uh, those statements are worthless? These men have never stopped their troops from engaging in the combat that they see necessary. Well, you would laugh if it wasn't so tragic and if the consequences weren't so real to the people of Sudan. Um, but I think we have to put into context the, the promises of these generals that they've been making to people like the Secretary General of the United Nations or the Secretary of State, promising uh, ceasefire after ceasefire, now allegedly uh, you know, agreeing to go to a third country for peace talks. Um, these are all tried and true strategies of the military and the RSF uh, to appear uh, that they are cooperating with uh, calls for peacemaking, to appear uh, to show respect for international laws, when in fact they are doing quite the opposite on the ground. And, and this goes back to uh, the days of negotiating the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the days of negotiating with the South Sudanese, with the Darfuris uh, almost a generation ago. Uh, so we are not... Um, you know, we are not surprised or we shouldn't be surprised uh, by these tactics being employed now. Uh, sadly, though, I think we're seeing a new generation of officials and international diplomats falling for these uh, tactics again, believing the generals, uh, but not holding them accountable when they do violate uh, their word. Right. So uh, let me turn to, um, to Saudi Arabia here, because now we have what are supposed to be uh, these peace talks uh, in Saudi. So, Mohammed, first of all, why has Riyadh offered to host this meeting? <clears throat> That's a good point. You could say, why not Egypt? We could say, why not at least Ethiopia, some, some neighboring or bordering country? But I think the Saudis already experienced a conflict with Yemen, and now they are playing a big role in the area with the Iran, peace talks, Syria, and maybe other in Lebanon. So it's a, they have a good enough trust in, in Saudi Arabia. But maybe the question is, will the Saudis success? And that's what I thought is the, the two generals, they were completely friends, and sudden, when was that, in 10th of April or early morning? And there is a conflict. So I don't think so that the Arab leagues or the Saudis will do as what the Sudanese are expecting or the international law expecting, though that the, the two generals, they don't have that strong forces that somebody will win. Uh, what I saw that Mr. Hamidi is having uh, ground forces quite professional. Yes, the government with Mr. Burhan, but I thought that's another ignite in the area for, for clashes and to keep the area in, in, its, in its disaster uh, time. So the Saudis mm -hmm. doing their best since the Egypt been away from it and the other neighboring country. But I hope that, that they succeed, but I have a doubt that the conflict will stop. Why? Because there was no conflict and sudden when the area ended up in, in, in a peace and negotiation between neighboring country, here we see the conflict in Sudan. Okay. So to me, I'm not saying there is a conspiracy, 
but I think that that they want the area to keep in in, 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 in this situation. Okay, Cameron, I just have to come back to you quickly because you might have a different perspective on what Saudi's interests are actually in these these talks. I mean, Saudi has a lot invested uh, in Sudan. There's a huge agricultural, in particular, very important agricultural investment. Uh, and there's also been, you know, with, with the leverage, economic leverage of the UAE and Egypt, and the UAE has also had military involvement with Hemeti, in particular, contributing troops on UAE's behalf in the war in Yemen. Uh, I mean, tell us where you think Saudi's interests really lie, or are they just kind of benevolently volunteering uh, an opportunity to moderate? Well, listen, there's no benevolence uh, by any international actor. These are all uh, countries uh, looking after their own self-interest. Uh, the question is whether that self-interest uh, overlaps or coincides with the interests of the Sudanese people. Uh, I think we can't deny the role that the Saudis have played uh, since the fighting began, uh, a very positive role, I would say, uh, obviously helping uh, to evacuate people out of Port Sudan, um, you know, issuing uh, calls for, for calm, engaging with international partners like the United States. So I think that, uh, you know, the Saudis are doing a lot, frankly, to, uh, as your guest said, kind of burnish their reputation, move away from the legacy of their dirty war in in Yemen uh, and frame their you know their themselves and and kind of redefine themselves as peacemakers in the region. So they're certainly doing that. But as you suggest, uh, you know the Saudis have uh, a real national security interest uh, in the stability of Sudan, guaranteeing their access to those mm -hmm. agricultural investments, but also making sure uh, that there is a friendly regime uh, and a me measure of stability. In, uh, in Khartoum, because after all, they do share a, a sea border uh, with, with Sudan. So they're not immune from, uh, from instability that, that might be emanating uh, from Sudan from this conflict. So they have a real stake in this, just like other countries have a real stake in this. I think that the question is, do we need to have some other involvement in these peace talks? Uh, I think we forget oftentimes that Sudan is an African country. And as people are flowing out of the country, they're flowing into uh, bordering states with Sudan in Africa. And I think that we have seen a real absence from the African Union and mm -hmm. other African states uh, contributing to peacemaking efforts. This can't just be a Western and Arab world um, you know, decision-making process. Okay. Muna, let me ask you, when you hear General Al-Burhan's special envoy say uh, that all of this is just an internal matter that they will contain and that they will not allow for any, as he calls it, foreign interference. Uh, do you agree to any extent? And, and what do you think, to him, qualifies as foreign interference? Well, if it wasn't coming from Burhan, I would say I would agree. But Burhan, Burhan himself is the one who is taking part in these atrocities. Mm -hmm. He is the one who made this draft. Uh, uh, rapid uh, speed forces uh, equal to the Sudanese army. He is the one with al-Bashir previous, uh, previously also uh, emptied the army from the national uh, officers and made it, it's not an institution anymore. Uh, he is controlled by the National Islamic Front cadres, and he is not the one that who can lead the country to peace. I don't believe him at all. Whatever he says, I don't believe him at all. And so many of the Sudanese, that's why I find it very difficult for us uh, to take part, whether with, uh, with uh, the street forces or with Burhan, because for us, both of them are criminals. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take, uh, take the side of the army because we know that there is no army. This is a big lie. There is no army. Maybe very few officers, maybe. But most of the army is now uh, run by uh, other people. Okay. And don't forget also that they have their own alliances. Each one of part of the each one of them has his own alliance. So um, both of them are lying. Both of them are playing games. Both of them are not for peace. Mm. Muna, I, I have to ask you if you think at this point overthrowing Omar al Bashir was actually all in vain. I mean, has the alternative now proven any better? 
No, Omar al-Bashir is the one who started it. Mm. This is accumulation of Omar al-Bashir and his gang. These are the continuation of whatever he was doing. So it's all about the Islamic Front and also those who came as uh, parts interested in Sudan, those who have interest in Sudan, I mean regional or maybe international alliances. So what's happening now is also a result of uh, the 35 years ago coup d'etat. So it's accumulating mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed, I have to come back to you then and, and off the back of what uh, Cameron was saying. Given what Saudi's interests are, we noted the agricultural sector in particular, please help us understand how big of a priority it needs to be for the Gulf to keep Sudan as a stable entity as much as possible. They wish, I mean, what I... Now, let me just remind you with one thing. The changes going in the region, especially if you look at, and excuse me to go out a little bit, if you look at the, the peace talk between the Saudis and the Iranians, mm. who, who led that, that peace talk? Is the Chinese. Who is supporting a little bit back in, in the Ukrainian and the Russian war? Is some, some, some of the countries in the Middle East. So the Middle East now have a big guest coming, which is the Chinese. And th that's the way I look at it. The Saudis, they, they, they wish that the Sudanese are getting stable. Yes, we have some economics business. Yes, we are looking, as the, your guest talk about, there is a, a sea border, there is an agreement, the Red Sea border security. But I thought, Ms. Sandria, is the, the Sudanese themselves, they don't have a control of this conflict. A reality, as I think it's a bigger than this, the U.S. people, they are trying to stop the Chinese from expanding. The big hit from the Saudis toward the Americans that the negotiation between the Iranians and Syrian and the Saudis being solved and the U.S. people are away. So it's not Sudanese conflict. I thought it's, it's a bigger, but the Saudis will do their best. But let me remind you something. There is no al-Bashir conflict. There is no intervene from the neighboring country like the Ethiopians are trying to force the Egyptians due to the uh, Al Ali Dam. No, I think that's bigger than this, but the Saudis will do their best with their neighbors. And I think they are with the coming soon meetings in, 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 in uh, the okay. Arab leagues. There should be sometimes in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Yeah. They, you know, should, they should discuss the problem, but it will be, it, it will be under a, a real difficult especially hmm. those two generals already experienced the fights, so it's yeah. not easy. It will be another Yemen, by the way, if the Arab leagues did not work hard with the Saudis to stop the conflict. Now, that, is, that is hard to hear, that it will be another Yemen. But, I mean, Cameron, you yourself have said there's a risk that, you know, other countries or militias will become involved in this conflict. So expand on that. Which, which ones? And do you foresee another Yemen-style scenario? Well, I think the, the irony here is that many of us uh, who have been watching Sudan for many years had always predicted uh, or, or anticipated this as a worst case scenario, this, this, this conflict between the SAF and the RSF. And now we're having to rethink what that worst case scenario is uh, virtually on a daily basis uh, because of this conflict. And so I, I do think that now the thing we have to worry about is not only militia groups from the from the neighboring region, but countries uh, from the region. We know, for example, that Egypt is not uh, playing a, a neutral role in this. They are active militarily on the ground. We know that they have bombed uh, RSF targets inside Sudan. Uh, we know that, uh, that the uh, Libyan warlord Haftar uh, mm -hmm. has been moving fuel and weapons into the conflict. We know that the RSF is trying to recruit very heavily right now from among the Zagawa and Rizagat communities inside of Chad. Uh, there are um, rebels from the Central African Republic that were previously organized by the Wagner Group and the RSF 
who are reportedly making their way into this conflict. Uh, so there are a number of places where uh, there are uh, outside interveners already happening. I think that if this conflict continues uh, on the course that it's on, and certainly if one side begins to gain an advantage over the other, I think you could see a flood of outside actors entering into this conflict, both formally, you know, governments, and also informally through rebel and militia groups in the region. So that could create um, a real, not only humanitarian explosion for the country, yeah. but also make it much more difficult to try to unwind from a political standpoint. Muna, as a Sudanese person, what, what do you feel when you hear that? I mean, this, uh, we're, what it looks like we're seeing it's, right now is nothing compared to what it could be, according to what uh, the dynamics Cameron's just described. Yeah, it's saddening. But for me, I uh, I had these scenarios in my mind because I worked for uh, maybe the last 30 years uh, in war zone areas. So I've seen how uh, the war can do to people. And I've seen already destroyed areas. I've been in Darfur in 2004, where, um, in 2005, uh, when the genocide took place, although they say it's war atrocities, but for me it's genocide. So uh, I thought it was always going to spread, uh, mm. especially with the wrongdoings, with, with the atrocities of the Sudanese regime now, and with Hemeti taking uh, the mercenaries, taking um, the lead in uh, beating people, in killing uh, people in 2019, and denying what he did. And mm. also with Burhan playing games with the same people and also uh, claiming that they are there for the human rights. And then recently you've seen people out of prison, uh, those who are, uh, some of them are requested by the International Criminal Court. Mm. So what I see now is not promising because I know they are all lying. They are all lying and they have their alliances outside who are interested in Sudan in its wealth and in uh, controlling the country and taking part of, of the country. And with our revolution taking place uh, for five years now, peaceful demonstration, peaceful protest uh, met with uh, savage and violence acts uh, with absent, totally absence of uh, protection to people that had come to the recent situation, to the current one. So I think I think it's going to be a very bad situation for Sudan. And soon, maybe, as we've seen, that the South has gone its way. And we've seen now, um, for a long time now, they are fighting, uh, I mean, uh, almost separation between uh, the Southwest yeah. and uh, ABA. And then look at Darfur. Now, while they are fighting in Khartoum, they are also killing people in uh, Darfur. And with the vast, um, a vast country like Sudan with open borders, you know who is coming also with other arms to like Hemeti or others, maybe other uh, military groups, militias mm. as well. And how the Arab countries, the, the most strong Arab countries are interested in Sudanese wealth and land. Maybe they are coming, yes, according to agreements, but the mm -hmm. agreement was, was done while the uh, uh, violation of human rights in Sudan was there. And you've seen now how many coup d'etat happened, but none of them has condemned it. Okay. So, uh, well, yeah. We, we've got so one, this, just one yeah. minute left, uh, and I, I just want to get Mohammed's thoughts on, uh, on that. I mean, should the Arab... Leading Arab countries have stepped in and condemned what they saw was wrong from the beginning, or did they deliberately stay out of it because they were after what they needed out of, out of Sudan? You know, this is a good point, but that's the sign that the conflict, since it's early April and sudden 9 o'clock we see the conflict, so the, the Arab, I thought, the Arab leaders are shocked. Maybe their intelligence, they knew there will be something, but they will try to do their best, honestly, this, especially the, the big countries like the Saudis, and Iraq now is coming back, the, the, mm -hmm. the security, unstable uh, in Sudan. It will affect the, the, the Red Sea, uh, ships, uh, oil, flow, uh, all, just, just names. But they, do, they will do their best. 
but they will never be a bias to, to somebody. I saw the minister of the uh, Saudi's foreigner, uh, Prince Faisal. Uh, he met Mr. Hamidti, and they, they talked about that they do their best to get together and table. But the I'm question sorry. is, what, uh, what uh, last point, what is the, the, the conflict requirement, or what is the need of this conflict? Mm. There is no goal of this conflict. Sudden, Still 9 o'clock in the determined. morning, we see this conflict. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's what I, what I saw is, is a conflict need right. to be relook at in, in a different way. Mohammed, that will have to be the final word because unfortunately we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us and our viewers, of course, for tuning in as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time. Thank you.